Ladies and gentlemen, to present your inaugural address is a once-off occasion in the life of an academic. In 2005, the last year I wrote as follows, and I quote, Inaugural lectures are an established tradition in universities all over the world. It is an auspicious occasion that allows newly elevated professors to either summarize their research achievements or profit to the academia and the nation critical views and recommendations on matters that are of strategic importance. End of quote. And that is exactly, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, what we expect tonight from our new professor, Shan Simmons. It is my honor to welcome you all to this auspicious occasion to quote Palasi again. We are privileged to have our executive dean with us tonight, and he will also later and, uh, the certificate, or present a certificate to Professor Simmons. Professor Conley, we are glad that you had to change, could change your schedule at a very short notice in order to join us. To the members of the procession, welcome, and especially so to a number of colleagues from other universities. A special word of welcome also to Professor Leslie de Grange, de Grange and Professor Cornelia Roux, who will also perform duties during the program. On a more personal note, what an honor to have Ms. Mrs. Jackie Simmons with us tonight, the mother of Professor Shan Simmons. Mrs. Simmons will also say a word of thanks after the presentation of the certificate to Professor Simmons. Prof. Shan's husband, Mr. Stefan van der Waal, it's also an honor, our privilege, to have you here tonight. There you are. And a word of welcome to you all. And then welcome to all family members, friends, and staff members of the Northwest University. To everybody, welcome, welcome, le amogetswe, and wam kele kele. My introduction of Professor Simmons will be in two parts. The first part will be reading a biography, and I will commence with that. Shan Simmons is a professor in curriculum studies and a member of the LUH Wright Research Unit at the Northwest University, South Africa. The research sub-area citizenship also falls under her leadership within the LUH Wright Research, Research Unit. She is an NRF-rated researcher in curriculum studies, higher education, and human rights education who publishes actively. After completing her undergraduate studies at Stellenbosch University in 2008, she was awarded the Rector's Award for Excellent Achievement and the South African Teachers Union Medal for Academic Excellence in the Western Cape. In 2013, she graduated with a PhD under the supervision of Professor Cornelia Roo, who is also present here tonight. Her PhD included a joint study with the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam under the mentorship of Professors Ida Sabilis and Ina Ter Aves as part of the Sabusa International Scholarship. While in the Netherlands, she was also awarded an Intergender Research School Grant funded by the Swedish Research Council other PhD scholarships include her being awarded the Research Capacity Initiative, SAMPA, on uh, South Africa National Netherlands Research Program on Alternatives in Development, Bursary. She has successfully completed 11 masters and two PhD postgraduate students and has been invited to act as an external examiner of postgraduate studies from eight different universities. She has presented the papers at 24 national and 15 international academic conferences and published over 40 peer review publications, including articles and book chapters. She is also co editor of the book The Scholarship of Doctoral Education on Becoming a Researcher, published by Sun Africa Media, and as guest editor special issues in national and international journals, such as Alternation, the British Journal of, education, of Religious Education and Education as Change. In 2019, she was the recipient of an American Educational Research Association Outstanding Publication Award for a co-authored chapter in the book titled Global Perspectives on the Postdoctoral Scholar Experience. 
Research leadership positions include being one of the founding members and currently the, the associate editor of the accredited transformation in higher education journal. This is more than just an editorship, it is a dedication to raise generative discussions that can advance discourses on higher education transformation. Chan has been at the forefront in growing this journal and seeing it attain accreditation in 2021. The journal is list, listed on indices such as Scopus, ProQuest, ERIC, EPSCOHOST, and EOAG. She has also been on the executive committee of the South African Education Research Association since 2019 and is currently the vice president of this national research association. Internationally, Shan serves on the executive committee of the International Association for the Advancement of Curriculum Studies and represents the publications portfolio. In addition, Shan's international standing is also evident through her appointment as a South African representative for the Women in Higher Education Network, which is an international feminist research consortium. In collaboration with her WHEM -E colleagues, a stream for the 2023 Gender Work and Organization Conference has been approved and a book publication is in progress. Shan's scholarship resembles her dedication as a scholar activist in the ever-changing and continuously challenging intellectual work of curriculum studies. And I think that deserves a number of yes. I now call on Professor uh, Cornelia Rue, whom Shan has known since 2004, to share the dedication of 18 years with Shan. After that, colleagues, the rest of the program will, uh, until after the word of thanks, will continue without further announcements. Executive Dean Professor Lloyd Conley, Deputy Dean Research and Innovation Professor in Washington Dudu, School Director Professor Kubis Mens, uh, Professor Lisa Lagrange, and Professor Sharon Simmons. I'm going to say in this, in your biographical paragraph on your academic achievements, there's very interesting things that one can read. You describe yourself, and I quote, the scholar activist for ever-changing and continuous challenging the lecture of work in curriculum studies. I'm tonight immensely privileged to be part of this wonderful occasion dedicated to you and acknowledging the academic achievements of you, supported by your close family, children, friends, and colleagues. And I say your mother. Um, I have the, I've had the privilege of knowing Shan for the past 18 years of her academic life. She introduced herself to me in Stellenbosch as an English-speaking first-year student from Pyramid Rexburg, and eventually it was my turn to introduce her as my last doctoral student in 2013 at the graduation ceremony in Rochester. I've had the privilege of being a promoter of superb academic minds, some students cross one's path in academia only once, and then you realize that you have made a special person with the inquiring mind, knowing that you, your own academic life and undoors, and undoors will never be the same again. And you are bound to learn from this student, and this is and was my experience from Sharon. I'm scholarly interested in hermeneutics and all the disciple of understanding text and life stories. And I would like to relate the commentary to the wise words and sayings linked to the date, birth, of Confucius, the Chinese philosopher, politician, and teacher, whose messages of knowledge, kindness, compassion, loyalty, and virtue were and are still guiding the philosophy of China for thousands of years and underpinning East Asian cultures and societies, and for those in the Western world who seek wise words. Confucius is believed to have been born on the 28th of September in the year 551 before the Common Era. Thus, for me the date is very important and I want to link this date to share a special moment of him of doctoral lecture on the 29th of September in the year 2022. I would like to refer the words of Confucius for teachers and students and I quote, by three methods of way, man learn wisdom, by reflection, which is noblest, 
Second by Im imitation, which is easiest. And third by experience, which is the bitterest. Classical. Just a few personal highlights and characteristics that Sharon taught me on how to look at life. I call it my personal endowments with and admiration for Sharon. An inquiring mind in Christian studies, human rights education, and religious studies kept everybody on their toes from being a first year student to being the first period on a student ever to present a paper at ASRA. On religious studies and curriculum studies, students' reflections, which was highly recommended, refreshing, and informative. Most importantly, I want to ensure that there is always enough funding for the following year's study, taking up as an undergraduate student an annual au pair work in England during the December and January releases while other students resorted to the newest speech. But successful applications for bursaries and receiving awards since being the undergraduate to become the first recipient of the prestigious Emirates Student Bursary at the Faculty of Education in its Potchester in 2008. And with the answer about practice and praxis, and I think it was an issue, receiving student and prestige awards bursaries as an undergraduate and postgraduate student, young lecturer, scholarly making, professor showed integrity. It meant that many funding a bursary trust in academic societies and conference acknowledge her academic A manner of understanding finances and how to embrace opportunities made her share hotel rooms, taxis, on our international travelers and conferences. She's an early bird and I'm an out owl. She explored all accommodation, the cheapest, opportunities and registered religiously for conference within the early bird sections. Her immaculate understanding of data, finding and support for finalizing research reports of two international sandbag projects, nothing except to watch for I. Her notes and lists of what needs to be done in research project. A research assistant and manager that kept national and international professors on their toes to submit reports on time, keep emailing and reminding us that there is something like a deep date for professors as well. The precision in compiling research calendars and appointments, keeping the Friday afternoon slot at 4 o'clock open for research discussions and reviewing articles. She was the only student ever that had open access to my research calendar. A wonderful sense of humor, gifting me with Alzheimer, a survival kit, from a bottle of wine to a torch and other non-mentionable items to overcome the dangers, critique and believe it or not, conservative thinking of the Northwest University when I accepted the position at the Potchester campus in 2008. But courage to relocate to Potchester, leaving behind the student friends and the vineyards of Stellenbosch. Her unbelievable trust in academia, calling her mission curriculum studies where she could prosper and build a legacy and ensure her academic role will keep on rolling. Her faith in and believing in human God, taking on topics that keep us thinking about contested issues and difficult research questions. Her resilience, and we've seen it, in overcoming the most injured life threatening difficulties by living loved ones and overcoming health issues. Sharon, your resilience is, resilience is an example for the entitlement of endurance and your life, love for life. I thank you for being part of my academic life since 2004, when you walked into my lecture room in the Faculty of Education in Brennerfeldstall, towards the store, corner to the bottom fee, and the fourth floor office. Being a support to my German friends during my initial lecture in March 20, 2007, and congratulations from Indian. Our academic journey was full of fun and hard work, from being a first year student to your achievement for a dual PhD with the Freie Universität of Amsterdam. It was an honor to be your colleague at this university and to experience the trust your team, the vice team, the school director, especially Professor Kovas, and your colleagues and the NRA having the ability to step up to the expectation of being an international scholar. I would like to end this admiration with another quote from Confucius on how one needs to see academic and scholarly endowments. And I quote, The will to win 
the desire to succeed, and the urge to reach your full potential, these are the keys that will unlock the door to personal excellence. Take care. Thank you. state in 1994, I was aged 11. Although only a young school child, I was able to recognize how things were changing around me. However, I could not understand the deeper discourses that infused these changes. What I saw and what I experienced was a handful of black learners who entered our formerly white-only farm community school. Although there was no change in the teaching staff, I did not experience a sense of racial divide or discrimination. For me, all aspects of school life, such as the classroom, sports field, dormitories, and learner body, had become diverse and different, but not hostile. My high school years were very similar. A white teaching staff and a diverse learner body. I never questioned the race of teachers. In fact, I never questioned the race of anything or anyone. This is just how it was. And this is what I can remember from my school years. University was very different from school. Did it have to do with the educational space being intergenerational? Could it be because higher education offers students a platform for activism and academic freedom that is uncommon in schooling, with the exception of the iconic school boycotts such as the Soweto Uprising in 1976? Or was it contextual? The university where I was studying was a formerly white university at the time that still upheld, upheld a male-dominated white supremacy through various dimensions, such as the medium of instruction being Afrikaans, transition to the first black vice chancellor after a history of 25 different vice chancellors who were white, only one being a white woman, and 70% of a white student body. The divide was explicit. The generations before me came across as activists who were hesitant to let whites into their scholarly spaces. <coughs> They were the freedom fighters, those who bore the scars of years of discrimination. Some were angry, but mostly they were determined to protect what was theirs, what they and generations before them had fought for, including access to formerly white universities, which often were viewed as a source of privilege, being denied to all but a few and assumed as something that I took for granted. Then there was my generation, those who were trying to find where they belong. They were between a rock and a hard place. Were they the new black generation or were they becoming white? Names like top deck, white on the top or brown underneath, were very common slang in my generation. While I tried to understand the deeper stories of my peers, I was often sidelined for being white and not knowing the struggles of a person of color who was trying to belong in a new South Africa. I often had the impression that my black peers felt that, I would be that they would be betraying their ancestors if they united with whites. Among, the, among my other peers were those who grasped the opportunities that they were afforded through the avenues like financial support but often felt 
guilty about those left with little hope at home in a very unequal South Africa of struggle to survive each day. The stories of white people were sidelined because they are privileged, all of them without exception. But what did all of this mean? My black peers would not let me in and my white peers were resistant to even talk about the hurdles of race. I found myself in a very tensioned space that generated a mixture of confusion, anger, sadness, and so many questions. I longed to understand. I found comfort in academia. Academia created a platform for me to ask these questions that didn't have to have a personal insult or undertone to my peers. Through academia, I came to learn the discourse of human rights. As, uh, as one means to addressing South Africa's apartheid past has been to anchor it in human rights, inclusivity, and social justice. This has aimed to transform South Africa's politically as well as economically divided and di discriminatory past. Education was, and remains, the key to transforming society. As a United Nations member state, South Africa takes account of international human rights legislation, such as the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights, the ongoing world program of human rights education that dates back to 2005 already, and numerous other initiatives, such as the more recent 2021 UNESCO Education Futures Report. In addition to this, South Africa has also taken its own unique approach to designing the curriculum and infusing it with a culture of human rights. The National Education Policy Act of 1996 has set the stage for, start, for transformation in education. Its vision is the holistic development of each learner, moral, social, cultural, political, and economic development, and the adv advancement of democracy, human rights, and the peaceful resolution of rights. In the years that followed, stakeholder participation emerged in what was previously a very authoritarian education system. Politicians, academics, intellectuals, departmental officials, researchers, educators, even members of non-government non organizations were invited to participate in deliberations where the design and the development of a new curriculum underpinned by our democratic constitution could be imagined. Human rights education became a buzzword and was regarded as central to attaining the democratic and socially just education system. During this curriculum reform, the Department of Education openly pro proclaimed that it celebrated human rights in the curriculum, but acknowledged that it is largely misunderstood. In fact, research conducted by the department soon after the implementation of Curriculum 2005 showed that 78.4% of teachers believe that honoring human rights is central to their teaching practices and content that they teach leads to problems in the classroom. The reasons for this were plentiful and ranged from a lack of resources, insufficient training of teachers, inadequate time to meet the de de deadlines and demands of the curriculum, and the impression that the Department of Education was siding with learners by giving them a newfound freedom, which was the converse of our teacher-centered and often totalitarian approach to education in the previous dispensation. Professor Carter Asmal, the then Minister of Education, was at the forefront of the shift in thinking and in a more democratic approach to designing the curriculum. He initiated formal working groups and task teams on values in education starting from February 2000, teasing out and troubling human rights education as a value and a moral construct is an ongoing national concern in South Africa. But in the past years, iconic reports include the soundtrack, Values, Education, Democracy for the 21st Century, Manifesto on Values, Education and Democracy, the Framework on Values and Human Rights in the Curriculum, a Bill of Responsibilities for the Youth of South Africa, and another, um, another report is Values in Education. 
So Carter is um, Asmal preferred that it is because of the moral fiber of education that human rights values cannot simply be asserted through education or even the curriculum. They must be debated, be negotiated, be synthesized, be modified, and be earned as a process and not a product to be achieved. However, from my own research, human rights are often instrumentalist and judicial. They often, they often teach us right from wrong while instilling in youth what they are entitled to and the responsibilities of these entitlements. My research has revealed that primary school learners experience human rights as abstract, superficial and detached from their everyday lives. To some extent, this is because of the inability of curriculum content and teachers' practices to deal with the ethical contradictions that arise in the classroom. But for high school learners, my research has shown that the curriculum prioritizes human rights injustices and discriminations through emphasizing the inequalities that manifest in our society, such as gender-based violence, racial inequality, xenophobia, and even political dishonesty. Although South Africa is riddled with inequality, the tendency to portray society as irrevocably damaged obscures the beauty of difference and diversity, and its potential for coherence and the generative possibilities of the hope needed to realize social justice and equality ideals. The research that I have conducted with university students has shown that human rights can create binaries that reinforce the othering of some groups of society along racial, gendered, and class lines. When viewed in this way, human rights are not always transparent and emancipatory. They become a double-edged sword that can work in one, both one's favor, but also sometimes to one's disadvantage. My research findings have led me to trouble and to reimagine how we do and think human rights education with curriculum inquiry. The transformatory potential of human rights education does lie in its ability to make visible the complexities of human rights as both a discourse and a material reality. I am not denying that human rights can provide our youth with a language to interrogate society and how it continues to normalize ways of living and being in the world. Although this is the case, the application of human rights education in South Africa remains uncritical, monolithic, depoliticized, and largely decontextualized. I outline two inter interrelated reasons for this. The first lies in the universalistic tendencies of human rights that invoke individualism governmentality and advanced capitalism. When human rights are viewed as a universal, the epistemic locus of enunciation interprets human rights as if they are universal and good for all. Mignolo persists that human rights, as described by the 1948 Universal Declaration, presupposes that human is a universal category accepted by all and that as such the concept of the human does justice to everybody. Bradotti warns us that sameness of this kind is a regulatory mechanism and transposes a specific mode of being human into a generalized standard. For Giron, this universalistic image of human rights fuels the hegemonic global governments and moves towards ethical legal standards and the dictation of a global moral compass. The possible danger is, of this is that human rights are commodified as structures that govern our society. The result is a majoritarian model of rights which valorizes power and capitalist so social organization. Foucault's notion of dynamic normalization applies in this regard. Dynamic normalization as surveillance or the awareness of being observed has the potential to stifle individuality and create conformativity. People are normalized when they end up acting, thinking, and being the same for fear of being caught out or punished. As an instrument of power, dynamic normalization imposes homogeneity and self-governance. 
in some sense, human rights then, if viewed in this way, becomes representationalist. Representationalism is based on the belief that practices of, of representing have no effect on the objects of investigation. So when the world is held at a distance, human rights is largely just an object of discourse. Barat quietly avers that representationalism is founded on the premise that words, concepts, ideas, and the like accurately reflect or mirror the things to which they refer. This leads to reflecting on representations like a mirror image, with no effect on the objects of investigation, and in a sense, being nothing more than an iterative mimesis. When human rights are held at a distance, they become a separate object and a form of interaction within representations that set up to look for homologies and analogies between separate entities and as a result reflect on the world from the outside. What this could resort to in human rights is a human rights premised on rationality and the types of transcendental reasoning that dictate power hierarchies and unquestioning faith in the power of reason and transcendental thinking fuels cognitive capitalism and its profit motives. Where neoliberal governmentality capitalizes on the curriculum to instill human rights in ways that will increase universalism and sustain surveillance and regulation, it perpetuates mainstream developments of advanced capitalism. This gaze is a disguise to claim equal status amongst human beings in the world that are largely being dictated by history informed by European Renaissance, Western Christianity, and the Enlightenment um, concept of rationality of man. Thus, the second reason lies in the liberal humanistic tendencies of human rights. Described as the invention of the Euro uh, European humanists of the 15th and 16th centuries, Westerners disassociated themselves from coexisting communities that are regarded as a threat. The resultant classifications have served the evils of colonialism and led to Western Christian dominance over gender, class, race, religious groups, and particularly in terms of absolute possession and control of knowledge, and the denial of this knowledge to all people classified outside and below. <coughs> This also led to the reduction of non-Western others to build subhuman statuses, such as the sexualized other, the woman, the racialized other, the native, the naturalized other, like animals, the environment, or earth, to be devalued as different from and less than disposable others. So although feminists, post-colonialists, post-humanists, and other radical thinkers advocate for de-linking the human agent, from liberal individualistic views of the subject, society is still haunted with the complexity of who speaks for the human. And the, and the ongoing difficulties inherent in overcoming the way humanism has condoned intellectual traditions, normative frames, and institutionalized practices. This is closely linked to human rights um, as a colonial, Euro-Western, phallocentric, and Enlightenment construct, coloniality lives on through human rights because the concept of the human is loaded with ideas about secularism, individualism, and racism. Coloniality, like human rights systems, refers to the logic, culture, and structure of modern world systems. The organization of colonial discourses and practices has normalized the human as a single homogenized being ingrained in the white European man as rational, masterful, and a civilized being. So in some respects, human rights are caught up in a cultural imperialism and fueled by polycentric capitalist economies with experts in human rights addressing the denial of various sorts of rights. Bradotti's pedagogical tool of deep familiarization proves insightful. Bradotti contends that as a knowing subject, humans should disengage themselves from accustomed and dominant normative visions of what it means to be human. This form of decoding makes it possible to delink and trouble the relations 
relations so that one can unlearn the deeply vested Eurocentric, humanistic, and anthropocentric habits of thought that still dominate today. Bradotti believes that it is through defamiliarization that one can unlearn and decolonize one's imaginary so that one can make room for new ways of thought through de disidentification from century old habits of anthropocentric thought and humanistic arrogance. So although defamiliarization can involve a sense of loss and pain because it involves disidentification of cherished habits of thought and representation, it can also be emancipatory through the active processes of becoming that in act in depth breaks with established patterns of thought and identity formation. So for Bridotti, productive forms of conceptual disobedience are invigorated so that radical repositioning is possible and necessary. Bridotti elaborates that being, dis being disloyal to one's civilization is at times the best way to actually honor it, out of love for its underdeveloped potential as well as its actual norms. So for her, this can be sustained when presented as a process of consci consciousness raising towards unlocking the complexity of disidentification, as well as recognizing that it can be sustained only through collaborative relations. Through acknowledging and embracing defamiliarization as a complex and risky pedagogical tool, socially embedded and historically grounded communities can potentiate a much needed abandonment of undifferentiated unity totality and oneness. Through Bardotti's conception of defamiliarization, we can begin to think anew about human rights education and where the human, humanity and rights all remain contested areas in the curriculum. For Mignolo, human and rights should not only be entrusted in Western initiatives and the rhetoric of salvation, but also in a process of decolonization. In this regard, Mignola asks, how is it that human relations became enclosed in relation to rights and not in other terms? To me, this single signals the need to think more critically about how our curriculum often takes for granted a universalistic conception of rights without questioning the multi-layered and complex makeup of what such rights infer. This presents a static, abstract, disembodied, and binary conception of human rights. Zimbalis opines that human rights education needs to move beyond familiar theories that are vested in liberalism, multiculturalism, and cosmopolitan orientations, and instead invoke its ethical and incessant possibilities. This calls for hopeful and generative experimentation in thinking with curriculum to change the terms of human rights education and not just its content. So human rights education remains universalistic and humanistic in South African curriculum because of the deeply anthropocentric nature that continues to occupy curriculum studies and other humanist forms of intellectual labor. Educational institutions and curricula continue to be places of learning what it means to be human and to prepare young people to participate in a human-centered world. Post-humanism, understand as an opportunity for humanity to reinvent itself, can be embraced as a means of displacing and disposing humanness as a presumed ground or anticipated outcome of, ed of education. In my intellectual work, I playfully enact the possibilities of post-humanism to rethink human rights education with curriculum inquiry. Bradotti depicts the times that we live in as a post-human condition. The post-human condition concerns a qualitative shift in our thinking about what the human unit of reference for the human is now. Given how human lives are imbricated with other inhabitants of the planet, and with advanced technologies. Human lives have, of course, always been imbricated with other inhabitants of the planet. 
Haraway argued that the distinction between the biophysical and the social is flawed, and she depicted the synthesis between the two in her concept, nature cultures. Appreciating the synthesis has become important in contemporary times because human arrogance has produced false dualisms between nature as the given and culture as the constructed that has resulted in human destruction of the earth and accelerated the possibility of the sixth extinction. As technologies produced by humans have advanced, human lives have become entangled with such technologies. Haraway went as far to actually aver that we have become cyborg because the distinction between humans and technology have already collapsed and there is just no turning back. Just as human life has become entangled with technologies, so too have human rights, a man-made construction, dictated much of humankind's behavior, use of power, and ways of living on this earth. Bradotti presupposes that the human post-human condition is characterized by a post-human predicament. This predicament divulges that the concept of the human has exploded under the double pressure of contem contemporary scientific advances and global economic concerns. And this has necessitated a qualitative shift in our thinking about what exactly is the basic unit of a common reference of our species, our polity, and our relationship with other inhabitants on this planet. This has given rise to new age visions of advancement and development in both in a list of things, robotics, prosthetics, neuroscientific, and biogenetic technologies that provoke both elation and fear because of the possibilities they present for decentering man as the measure of all things. In a world dominated by the Anthropocene, which is the human impact on the planet, Humans are making their lives comfortable, compatible, and convenient through biotechnology, arti artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and the Internet of Things. But in so doing, these technological advancements have also accelerated what Haraway terms the capitalist scene. Coined by James Moore in 2009, this term rests well with Haraway because she deems the humanist universalism of the Anthropocene as false and arrogant. The capitalist scene signifies new liberal capitalism as the core of immense and irreversible destruction of humans and non-humans because it is driven by processes for making wealth through radical simplification rooted in global transportation of peoples, plants, animals, microbes, and in slavery, colonialism, heteronormative familialism, racism, and other form forced systems of production and reproduction. Such assemblages of human, biophysical technology can be destructive when these assembles are driven by human arrogance and greed through the negative form of power, protest us. The post-human predicament is an opportunity to empower the pursuit of alternative schemes of thought knowledge and self-representation so that we undertake generative experimentation to think critically and creatively about who and what we are actually in the process of becoming. The nature culture continuum creates one possible avenue towards thinking about who and what we are becoming in the post-human condition. As a continuum, nature and culture are not seen as binaries but rather multiple assemblages the self-organizing force of living matter that blow, blurs all boundaries between the given, <coughs> nature, and the constructed, culture, so that they are in interaction with each other. So boundaries between nature and culture have been blurred or displaced, uh, displaced by the complex configurations entangled in scientific <coughs> and technological advances and in ways that have shifted the anthropocentric gaze that has long sustained Earth, life on Earth. This continuum leads to considering how a human rights culture, as, constructed, as a constructive culture, is performing and dictating how we interact and exist with nature. Central to this is the invoking of a new image of the subject, as the human, non-human, more than human, and of human, planetary, and cosmic, given, and manufactured. 
A materialist Im image which accounts for the workings of power in advanced and cognitive capitalism grounded in specific locations and imminent relations is proposed as it foregrounds transversal connections among and within the material and the symbolic. So materialism, according to Bradotti, is central, central to understanding this nature culture continuum because it recognizes all life as a non-essentialist brand of contemporary vitalism and as a complex system. Viewed in this way, it makes it possible to invigorate lines of flight that creatively embrace the challenges of the post-human world. Without giving in to melancholy or panic at the potential of the capitalist scene to destroy all life as the planet remains on the brink of ecological disaster. The 21st century presents a multi-dimensional complexity that recognizes an affective relationality between humans, the environment, technology, and all other forms of life that yearn for a sustainable present and an affirmative and hopeful future. How might we imagine this image of a post-human rights? Post-humanism directly challenges the ways in which humanism has dictated politics and education, and is an urgent call for humans to begin to explore new post-humanist directions in research, curriculum design, and pedagogical practices. But for too long, whether consciously or not, as educators, we have approached schools as places where humans dwell to learn what it means to be human and to accumulate the kinds of skills and habits acquired to participate in human societies as adults. This occurs in spite of the fact that schools are connected with the non-human world in so many explicit and implicit ways. It pinpoints the critical need for new engagements with and for education in ways that questions who matters and what counts when we think with the curriculum how we design and how we enact our curriculum and the knowledge that this curriculum espouses. To some extent, it requires becoming post-human to undo the telos of humanism and its humanizing effects so that the human is not a separate category from all others, but is in neutral relation with others. Becoming post-human is contentious and fraught with difficulty. It should be considered um, as continually an, ins an, an incisive practice, not one that is done easily and sometimes not one that is done at all. Scholars like Patrick Hannafin, Janice Cull, and Upendra Baxi challenge the majoritarian model of human rights as the thinking of the human that is constructed as the white and neoliberal male to rather think of it as a micropolitics of human rights of post-human human rights. A micropolitics of rights is one which is practiced by embodied beings who act to reshape their position in relation to both law and biopower, opening ways to critique utilitarian liberal models of rights. Bradotti argues for a minoritarian thinking of rights as post-human. A liberal rights human fails to recognize the singularity and differential nature of human beings and thus, in order to be included within the protective clothing of liberal rights protection, one must first divest oneself of one singularity and become human, where human is figured as an abstract and always already male subject. As stated already, Bradotti averse that this involves becoming, min becoming min minoritarian, as premised on philosophical nomadism. For her, Minoritarian subjects have historically been the sexualized others, the racialized others, and the naturalized others, the less than human others, that have long been dehumanized or excluded from full humanity. Bradotti speaks about becoming minoritarian as the desire of becoming one with all that lives outside the human and becoming woman, animal, world, machine. This invigorates a deep yearning for a shift in subjectivity, relationality, relationality, and ethics. The essentializing masculine ego of the Western Enlightenment modernist self exemplifies Descartes' cognito, 
that the knowing subject who stands apart from the world to observe, describe, and measure and know it, keeping a distance from the world, a separation of self-world and the division of self-other reinforces the binaries of interacting with the world from a distance. It positions the human as a rational subject who represents the world as discursive and with an enlightenment ego of rational thought towards transcendental universalisms. Deleuze and Guattari question the human as the supreme I, whose rationality produces absolute truth and knowledge, and advocate instead a rhizomatic mode of being and knowing that is categorized by non-linearity, multiplicity, connectivity through assemblages. For Deleuze and Guattari, the human I is on an imminent plane in a way that it strips it of its ontological privilege to produce binaries, divisions, or hierarchies so that the human is not a self-contained individual entity. To embrace a subjectivity that functions in a nature culture continuum of non-linearity, the post-human subject is relational. Ethical, situated, embodied, embedded, embrained, and continuously becoming. When subject subjectivity is ecological, it fosters cooperation and not competition through the oneness of self and the cosmos in ways that are caring towards other humans and the more than human world. For Lagrange, finding vectors of escape from the arrogant I, the Western individualism, to generate new connections that open up alternative pathways towards becoming a humble I, as embodied, embedded, extended, and enacted are key to post-human subjectivity as being on an imminent plane without a prescribed transcendental morality. As viewed by Barat, subjectivity is not a matter of individuality, but a relation of responsibility to the other. This resonates with Barat's new feminist materialist theory of agential realism. Part of this is the ethico-onto-epistemology that sees knowing and being as a matter, material practice of engagement as part of the world in its differ differential becoming. Relationality is thus not only non-linear, but also intraactive. With each interaction and many fold of entangled relations is reconfigured. And this invigorates responsibility and accountability and entails an ongoing responsiveness to the entitlements of the self and other, the here and then, the now and the then. Barat explains that our interactions matter. Each one con reconfigures the world in its becoming. And yet, they never leave us. They are sediment to our becoming, they become us. And yet, even in our becoming, there is no I separate from the interactive becoming of the world. She develops this into a profound insight, I quote, Interactive respond, inter, interacting responsibility, responsibly as part of the world means taking account of the entangled phenomena that are intrinsic to the world's vitality and being responsive to the possibilities that might help us flourish. Meeting each moment, being alive in the possibilities of becoming, is an ethical call. It's an invitation that is written into every matter of all being and becoming. We need to meet the universe halfway, to take responsibility for the role we play in the world's differential becoming." End of quote. Bardotti's affirmative ethics framed in critical post-humanism offers some perspective. Critical post-humanism presents a highly generative moment underpinned by affirmative ethics as a collective practice of constructing social horizons of hope. In response to the flagrant injustices, um, the perpetuation of old hierarchies and new forms of do domination, one aspect of this is experimenting with human rights education as becoming post-human. When we become post-human, we invigorate affordances of post-human rights that are hopeful through decentering the anthropos, which is the human as distinct and uh, superior species, and the bios as life of humans organized in society. And we decenter this in favor of zoe geo techno relations as transversal entities that is fully immersed in and eminent to a network of human 
and non-human relations. So when anthropos and bias are decentered, the human is removed from its ontological pedestal and based on an imminent plane with animals and non-humans. So bios becomes zoe, which is the life of all living beings, whether human or non-human. And anthropos becomes zoe-centered egalitarianism. The affirmative ethics that Bardotti argues for is a zoe-driven ethics of affirmation. Such affirmative ethics requires us to think differently about ourselves. To recognize that ethics cannot be restricted to relations with other humans, but are open to interactions with non-human, post-human, and inhuman forces. Such ethics overcome moralistic notions such as the normative distinction between right and wrong, good and evil. The post-human subject therefore invigorates light of connection with other humans and non-humans, recognizing the vital force of life that is present in all entities which makes such entities endure and continue to become other than itself. The post-human subject is neither transhumanist nor anti-human. Transhumanists want to correct the flaws and limitations of the embodied human brain by using robotics and computa computational sciences plus clinical psychology and analytic philosophy to enhance neural capacity so that our brain can function at the same speed and agility as the computational networks that we humans have created. This image remains humanistic, as the human remains a meta-rationalistic entity striving to become a superhuman. The post-human subject is also not anti-human. Because it's, its intent is not inhuman nor invocative of the indifference towards and the lack of care for humans. Instead, it interrogates the self-representations and conventional understandings of being human, which we inherited. This requires being critical that humans are not a homogenous collection, namely the peoples as a unitary category that claims ethnic purity as a defining feature of authoritarian, nationalist, and native political regimes. For Bardotti, as a people of heterogeneous multiplicity, we are all in this together, but we are not one and the same. Because we are embodied, embedded, and embrained in processes of actualization through networks of natural, social, political, and psychological relations. As such, the post-human su subject invigorates processes of actualization as lines of connection and desire that generate an affirmative empowerment so that life, in all its forms, is advanced for the betterment of all. As Bradotti writes, affirmative ethics is a clinical practice of detoxing the poison of unfreedom, servitude, and the betrayal of our inner nature as dynamic entities of desire. The ethical good is accordingly equated with radical rationality, relationality, aiming at affirmative empowerment. The ethical project, therefore, is to rework assemblages where human rights and human rights education represents the anthropos, which is the human as distinct and superior species, and creates instead new assemblages in which zoe geo techno relations can be generated to ensure the enduring and the becoming of all life. So, in parting, when we invent practices that use post humanist theories in education in shallow and superficial ways, the imagining of the human as a sufficient ground for thinking remains intact. The challenge of our post-human times is not to use our curriculum for anthropocentric or autotelic ends that provide clear-cut and often humanistic solutions. Instead, we need to continuously experiment with what human rights could become in a zoe geo techno inter interactive relation in hopeful and affirmative ways that can reconfigure the world in its differential becoming. I thank you. Uh, the Executive Dean, uh, Prof. Lloyd Conley, and the Deputy Dean, uh, Prof. Washington Dudu, the School Director, Prof. Corbett Mendes, 
properly led rule, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I too met Shelley Simmons, Professor Simmons, in the year 2002 when I was a lecturer when she was in the first year. And I remember when she was a third year student, she was the class rep and had to come and see me um, as the departmental chair to deal with a very difficult issue. And then I taught her again in an honours year, honors year, and um, then she went to see Greener Pastures um, by leaving Stonebosch, Greener Pastures, I think, of different, of different kinds. Um, so, Professor Simmons' address, I think, raises questions for all of us, and, but maybe there are also some questions we might want to raise with um, Professor Simmons. Traditionally, an inaugural address has two um, people that play an important role. There's a Laura de Tor, who um, communicates high praise. And then there's the orator, an eloquent and skilled public speaker. So the Laura de Tor was Professor Cornelia Rue, and the eloquent and skilled public speaker, Professor Simmons. So I was wondering what I'm supposed to do, because your university does have an interesting tradition of also having a, a respondent. So I thought I would be the um, equivocator. Now, an equivocator is a respondent who avoids um, giving a clear, direct answer. <laughs> so I'm going to do two things. I'm going to um, <coughs> ask whether what Professor Simmons has shared with us um, actually means the death of the professor, because it is a, a professional in all the dress. And the second thing I'll do is to respond to some specific um, um, matters addressed by um, Prof. Simmons. Um, in the closing pages of his book, The Order of Things, Michel Foucault writes about the death of man, and I'll say the death of um, human. That the human is a recent invention, a fiction of modernity, and he writes, one can certainly wager that human would be erased. Like um, a face drawn in the sand at the edge of the sea. I think it's on some of the last pages um, of his book, The Order of Things. In writing about the death of human, Foucault did not refer to the literal animal species we call human, in other words, Homo sapiens. But the disappearance of a particular historical construction of the human, which was advanced through the disciplines such as philosophy, biology, and economics. So Foucault was writing about the end of humanism. So the end of humanism is witnessed in what um, is termed the post-human condition, and that's what Professor Simmons spoke to, which is the convergence of post-humanism and anthropocentrism. So the first, uh, the post-human relates, as we heard tonight, um, to humans' entanglement with um, technology um, of all kinds, and I won't elaborate on that. That raises the question of what now um, the unit of reference is for human. And the other is about um, human beings' relations or connections to non-human nature or the other than human world or the more than human world. As we inhabit a planet that we heard of is on the brink of ecological disaster, and we find ourselves in a time when for the first time we need to actually consider or contemplate the possibility of a planet without human beings. And what it means to educate in the post-Anthropocene. So the implications of all of this um, is the rethinking of the subject. And as we heard, um, from the arrogant eye to um, a subject that is ecological, embodied, embedded, embrained. Um, in other words, that the human gets um, dethroned, removed from his ontological pedestal um, and placed on an imminent, imminent plane with all modes of life. So the critical question um, that I want to ask is, does the death of the subject also mean the death of the professor? So um, the late um, French philosopher um, Jean-Francois Lyotard actually wrote about the death of the professor, but he responded in 1984 to another condition, and that was the post-modern condition. And his focus there was on epistemology, on knowledge and pedagogy, in other words, um, aspects of, of teaching. And he particularly critiqued um, 
a phenomenon in the post-modern condition, uh, which is performativity. And all of us know um, how we have witnessed the erosion of the professoriat in an uh, age of performativity, where um, what it means to be a professor often becomes a tick box exercise, and we see the, the increase of knavery um, in, in the system. But I think the post-human condition asks a different question about the death of the professor. Um, and it might imply rethinking what the professor is. Um, and it's suggesting, and I won't elaborate because Professor Simmons uh, spoke a lot um, about this, um, about what the post-human condition in the post-human world is all about and theories related to that. But it's about thinking about the fact that nothing pre-exists there's no entity that pre-exists the interactions that one actually has with humans, non-humans. Um, so for the professor, um, nothing pre-exists the interactions with, um, with other colleagues, with, um, le with um, students, and with the material conditions that we actually find ourselves in. And what that says is um, that a professor or professor is actually a becoming. And so we're always actually becoming professors. And in that sense, um, it does talk to us about the death of the professor, but that doesn't mean, colleagues, that the titles you hold dear, um, I'm not arguing that that should be removed. <laughs> so talking a little bit about the, um, some aspects of Professor Simmons' um, address, so she's, she spoke about the interpolation into human rights discourses, um, generally and specifically into human rights um, education. And then she moves um, on to critique both um, human rights discourses as well as human rights education. So we, we heard all about that, and there are two broad critiques. Um, the one, the universalist tendencies of human rights that invoke individual, individualism, neoliberal governmentality, as well as advanced um, capitalism. And the second, the, the liberal humanistic tendencies um, of human rights. Um, what the matter is actually about, what, what has happened is we have emphasized um, the human in the human being. And when you emphasize the human in the human <coughs> being, then you essentialize and you universalize what the human is and you forget about the being of the human being that some phenomenologist um, like Heidegger spoke about. And of course not, we don't emphasize the becoming of the human being. But what um, Professor Simmons does, she, um, she does not throw out the rights baby with the um, human rights bathwater. And so she makes an argument for post-human rights, um, informed by ideas um, of post-human theories. So we've listened to um, a, a, an eloquently and skillfully um, arranged address but maybe there are one or two um, questions, and um, I'll, talk, I'll talk to that now. So in the um, presentation, um, Professor Simmons um, conflates humanism with humanness, and I think you can do that. But within the um, tradition that I also work in, where we talk about Ubuntu as being humanist, um, there's a clear distinction between humanness and um, humanism. So to quote, um, for the sake of time, Ramosi writes that humanness, humaness, right, suggests both a condition of being and a state of becoming, of openness, of ceaseless unfolding. It is thus opposed to any ism, including humanism, for this um, tends to suggest a condition of finality, a closeness, closeness or a kind of absolute either incapable of or resistance to any um, other movement. So you and I can have a further conversation about that um, Prof Simmons. And then about post-human rights. So I'm a little more reluctant than um, Professor Simmons to accept the idea of post-human rights. Post-human rights would suggest that we would have to extend morality beyond human communities. I mean, that, that would be obvious. So it reminded me of some work that has been done in environmental philosophy that's called intermediate axiology where you get uh, model extensionists, like many of you will know animal rights movements, that you extend rights um, beyond human communi communities to sentient beings, and then you also get um, reluctant holists. But if you extend um, 
post-human, um, if you extend morality, how do you do that if the, the ontologies are actually relational? How do you extend human rights um, uh, in, in that particular um, context? Because is it to assemblages or what would it be to? Um, because nothing precedes interactions as the point that I've made earlier and I think um, Prof Simmons herself has actually argued that. So in animal rights movements, what's problematic with that is that um, um, those that argue for that, they actually anthropomorphize um, rights. They're extending um, something that is unique um, to the species human beings, um, to animals, and I think it would be problematic to try and um, anthropomorphize um, ontological um, relations. And then, of course, Spinoza has been very helpful, and I think here's the key. And that's why I would prefer probably to talk about ethics only and not to talk about rights. Because Spinoza, Spinoza says to us, what we need to do is to naturalize ethics and not to moralize nature. So what does such an ethics um, mean for what I um, might be arguing for? That it requires us all to love the world. And that means to take responsibility um, for the world and all its atrocities. Gender-based violence, wars, environmental destruction, xenophobia, unemployment, unhoused peoples, landlessness, homophobia, and I can prol proliferate so many uh, more. And the responsibility is with a hyphen to say, what are the abilities that we should have to respond to all of that? What should a professor profess about in this particular context? So it's the ability to respond, and I'll end with as Barad said, to love um, attentively. Thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge, not to say, to acknowledge Prof. Cornelia Ruth, as well as Prof. Levin Lagrange. You have just convinced me that we should not cut out that section from our program. You know, in the last one, uh, the DBC said to me, you know, it's only faculty of education that does this. And I'll continue because you really gave us food for thought, as did the VIP, very important professor. <laughs> uh, also gave us, uh, you know, lots of uh, food for thought. So it is my privilege uh, to, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, of Tiobeca to present to you uh, the certificate. You know, I just want to say, colleagues, it's about just less than eight years ago when I first crossed paths with, with Shan and a dear colleague, a dear friend who sits here right in front here. And I had no doubt at that point that this day is going to happen because of the interaction that I had with her, the way she, she not only uh, things, but how she interprets and how she expresses herself. And to me, it was inevitable that this day would happen. So I'm so privileged that I could be here on this day to hand over this very important certificate to you and your family. I want to congratulate you. Process. So these beautiful pens are handmade by a member of staff at the Northwest University. This is going to allow you to write your future in a very special way. Congratulations, my friend. Uh, good evening, everybody. For those of you that, of you that don't know, I'm Shan's mum. Very, very proud mum, indeed. So, Shan has afforded or gifted me the opportunity of explaining her thanks. However, rather than being traditional with the, ter with the term thank you, we will cheers. Cheers signifies more than being part of the, sorry, let me start that again. 
Cheer signifies more than thank you. It also acknowledges all of those who have been part of her journey and central to the success of today's celebration. She has always had an eager mind and eager to learn and grow, thus surrounding herself with people who feed her mind and her soul. She would like to toast and acknowledge Stefa, her wonderful husband, friend, pillar of strength, sometimes sounding block, but biggest supporter. Then there's also a saying that goes, it takes a village to, to raise a child. In this case, it is children. Gert, Gert, Linda, Lindy, Adam, Hannes, Bianca, Jan and Luandi. You are her village. Thank you. Her sister, cousins, aunties, uncles, spouses of said, her late grandparents and her stepdad for want of another word. Boyki, Granny, Roxy, Dale, Candy, Rowan, Russell, Corey, Nikki, Jaden, Amy, Brendan Bradley, Auntie June and Brennan Baxter. Unconditional love and support in abundance and the biggest fans. Her colleagues and mentors that have been her inspiration and challenged her academically, her first year lecturers at Stellenbosch, Professors Cornelia Rue, I'm not big your pardon, Chris Reddy, Leslie Lagrange, and Johan Hastek, and of course Professor Petro Dupria, from Shan being her assistant to her colleague and to her great friend. Colleagues of more recent years, Professor Salvin Blifner, Lavi Ramathan, Murti Maestri, and Dr. Anne Baker. Her mentors and postgraduate, Drs. Anya Fesser, Fisser, Anna Krik de Wet, and Anyani. Um, the leadership of her inauguration, Professors Jeffrey Mafefele, excuse me, and Washington Dudu who lead by example and expose Shan to other dimensions of academia. The leadership and support of her faculty and research unit for being the backbone in her daily work and success. The Dean, Professor Lloyd Conley, and the school director, Professor Quervis Menz. The research unit director, Professor Johan Boerter, and the A team, behind them, Cheryl, Eloise, Teresa, and Rina. The guys behind the scenes, catering decor and flowers. Then her choice, who embrace her for who she is as a person, support her and remain a rock in her life. Gina, Malise, Kone, Naomi, Andy, Charlene, Carla, and Chanel. And then from me to my baby girl, Shane my rock star, my fighter, my go-getter. Your tenacity, chutzpah, strength amaze me every single day. You've got this, you can do it. I love you, Timothy. So, as one, so one and all, we will cheers to a chapter that has closed and cheers to the chapters that are yet to begin. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, from here to down here, um, it is refreshment time almost. And um, yes, the evening is coming to a close for now, but there's still more to come of a more informal nature. I think you'll agree with me, after 10 years in Portugal's room, Shan's English is pretty, pretty good. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, colleagues, after the singing of the national anthem, uh, Professor Simmons and her husband, will lead the procession to the door. They will stand at the door where we will all have the opportunity to congratulate them. Following the congratulations, there will be a photo session and those involved will be called by our staff from the Dean's office. Usually, protocol is that some of the dignitaries are part of the photo session. Professor Simmons said, no, no, no. Everybody will be in a photo. Still fine? Okay, and she will call them once you are required for the photo. So please, uh, you are welcome to go down to the refreshment area, just down the stairs, but photos will be taken in between, and you will be notified when you, when you will be needed. 
So enjoy the rest of the evening with our new professor, Shannon Simmons, and her husband, Mr. Stefan Parval, and also her um, family, her friends, and her colleagues.